Um, Our theme verse for the whole month is out of Isaiah 52. And it's in verse nine. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace and who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. What a powerful verse. This, as we mentioned last week, is the heart of our God. That we would, as his people, as those that are recipients of his love, of his grace, of his salvation, that we would go out and we would proclaim that salvation. That we would proclaim the good tidings of the birth of Jesus. uh, Talking about his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, and ultimately his ascension back into heaven, but coming to live in us by his Holy Spirit. We have a powerful story to tell. And, uh, and we're called to tell it. And, you know, last week we talked about what it actually means to use our words telling about the goodness of God in our life, that, that love that comes from Jesus and how important that is. But in this week and next week, we want to talk about how our life can actually tell a story too. How we live our life tells a story. Because for a lot of us, it's very difficult to actually share our faith with words. Maybe you're shy, maybe you're just uncomfortable, whatever it is. But there's many aspects of our life that can actually tell of the goodness of God. You know, you have a story to tell, but your life is also a story that is very out loud and spoken and and visible to the people in our life. And how many of you know, if we tell people about our faith in Jesus and talk to them about our faith, but they see that our life doesn't match up with that, we've lost everything we've said to them. You know, telling it is important, but living it is just as important. And people are watching us. If if people in your life know you're a Christian, they are watching you. Whether you understand it or not, or whether you really realize it or not, people are watching what we are doing because it matters. And we are called to live in such a way that it would tell of the, the, the faith that we have in our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ. And um, I know some of you might think, well, you know, isn't it, isn't it good enough that, I'm, that I am a Christian and that I, you know, I come to church, I try to be a good person. You know, if I'm in traffic and somebody needs to get let out of a side road, I always let them in. And, you know, I hold the door for people. I'm, I try to be a nice person. Isn't that enough? Um, why do I have to focus on, on, uh, on going and telling it? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, Jesus told us to do it, but also it, it, it speaks to what we really believe. In fact, I'm going to share a verse with you that's out of... Uh, James chapter two, and it's from, it's verses 14 to 19 and then verse 26 as well. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, this is a very hard-hitting scripture. I I talk about this a lot. I love James because James does not pull punches. He, he doesn't use marshmallows or teddy bears. He uses hard-hitting truth in our life. And what, what I basically believe is I believe that, that our life is either going to speak to others that we live for, for others or we live for ourselves. That's what it's going to say to others. It doesn't, or, or words are, you know, they say words are cheap. Now, they're not meaningless. Words matter. But if our actions aren't followed up after our words, it doesn't, it doesn't hold any weight. And what James is saying here is that if you have faith, he says, I will show you my faith by what I do. Now, before you get, get some of you get in a tizzy and say, oh, no, we're not saved by that. We're saved by grace. You know, of course we're saved by grace. We are saved by grace through faith. Amen? There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. This is not a salvation issue. He's not saying if you don't do a bunch of deeds, you're not saved and you're going to hell. That's not what James is saying here. He's saying your faith is dead. But he's not saying you don't have faith. He's just saying it's dead. So what does that mean? What, 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 I, what I interpret that to mean, and this verse gets interpreted uh, incorrectly a lot of times, but the way I interpret this verse, he's not saying that if, you're, if you have faith without deeds that you have no faith or that uh, you're not saved anymore. What he's saying is that your faith is not reproducing what it's meant to reproduce. Our faith is designed to reproduce faith in the people in our lives. It is meant to, to, to have fruit that comes from it. He's saying if your faith isn't followed up with actions, there's not going to be any reproduction there, and your faith is dead, and your faith is going to die with you when you die. You're not going to spread it to the people in your life. And he's saying that's dead faith. That is not doing what it's meant to do. 
Because you see, the, the things we value in life, the things that matter to us, we do reproduce those in our life, sometimes without even trying. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Like my, my dad was a contractor for years, so he always had to have pickups or vans or whatever. Always, always, always bought Ford. Every time. Now, whether you're a Ford or Chevy guy or Dodge or Toyota, whatever it is, he was very partial to Ford all the time. That's all I ever saw. And I learned later in life that it was because his dad, who was also a contractor, always bought Fords. His dad was very drawn to Fords. He, he never bought anything that wasn't a Lincoln, Mercury, or Ford, ever. I never saw my grandpa on anything but one of those. So he passed that on to my dad, who made him more partial to Fords. So when I became a contractor and had to buy a pickup, guess what I bought? A Toyota. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just making sure you're listening. No, I bought a Ford too, because I was always kind of more drawn to them. I thought they looked nicer, you know, and, and it, it was just something that was instilled in me from my dad because of what he cared about. And so it was passed on to me without even trying. Uh, another example, I think, I think of, um, my, my wife hates mayonnaise with a passion, okay? Mayonnaise will not touch her lips. If it does, she's going to go running, screaming out of the house like her hair's on fire, okay? <laughs> hates it. Uh, she had an incident when she was a child. Somebody forced fed her mayonnaise, and she hates it. Well, she does most of the cooking in our home. So guess what my kids' predisposition is towards mayonnaise? They hate it. They hate mayonnaise. The funny thing is about my kids, I don't even think they've ever tried it. They just hate it because mom is reproducing that in their life because of her wretched despisal of it. Okay? <laughs> now, I don't know how she's saved and not eat mayonnaise. I, I don't get it. But because we know that redeemed Holy Spirit-filled people like mayonnaise. <laughs> but nevertheless, she hates it. So consequently, my kids hate it. In fact, as a sidebar here, my 15-year-old's uh, birthday is today. Happy birthday, Kenzie. <laughs> she always complains that she has a December birthday. She's like, I only get gifts once a year. I'm sorry for all you December birthday people. You kind of got hosed, but it is what it is. Uh, but anyway, so we, we reproduce what matters in our life. And it's the same thing with our faith. If our faith is important, if, if what matters to us in our faith, if we live it out, it's going to reproduce that in the people in our lives. You know, it's much, the, the statistics are off the chart through the roof of kids that, that follow Jesus, of those that have parents that follow Jesus. It's because the parents are instilling that faith in their kids. It just makes sense. And so James is saying here, your faith without deeds is dead because it's not doing anything except helping you. And our faith is not designed just to help us. Our faith is here, it's designed to help others too. It's supposed to start here and it's supposed to go out. We're supposed to go out and we're supposed to tell it. That's the design for God, for each one of our lives. And it's so important that we make sure we live in such a way that our faith is evident and it reproduces faith in the people's lives that we have influence with. Okay, we all have influence in life. We all have a circle of friends, a circle of influence, whether it's family, coworkers, neighbors, friends, whatever it is, we all have influence. And God has called us to use that influence to affect the people in our life for his glory. Amen? Now, the, thing, the reason that... Uh, that this is such an important thing is because we are in a war for souls, okay? We as Christians are in a war. I, 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 I hope somebody has told you this in your life, but you have to understand that when you enlisted into faith in Jesus, you actually enlisted into a war, okay? This war has been going on since long before you or I were here, and it's gonna be going on long after we're gone, as long as Jesus tarries, until Jesus comes back and takes his place on the throne forever and, become, and comes back as the king, this war is going to be going on. This, some of us have been uh, brought into Christianity thinking that, that the Christian life is a pleasure cruise, when in reality, the Christian life is a battleship, okay? And we have to get out of this mindset that our Christian life getting saved is about, you know, being able to kick back and enjoy our faith. I, I've only ever been on one cruise. It was back in 04, Joy and I went on a cruise. She was pregnant with Mackenzie actually back then, and uh, she got pretty sick during her pregnancies and then you know the ship doing this didn't help and the cabins are small and she's a little claustrophobic sometimes so we haven't been back but i loved it i mean i could go on a cruise every month because it is it's like a fantasy world you're sitting there and you get to eat as much as you want people just bring stuff to you you're like bring me more lemonade more iced tea you know next time bring my tea with less ice you know you just you just shout out commands people just bring stuff to you you kick your feet up I remember one point sitting by the pool and I was like, you know, I haven't eaten in an hour and a half. I think I'm going to go eat, you know, not hungry, but it's irrelevant. You know, on a cruise, you do preventative eating. You make sure you don't get hungry. Right. And, and, but that's not the real world, is it? You know, eventually that cruise ends and you go home and you get back in the grind. That's the real life. 
But we, can, but we can really enjoy those cruises, and that's great. But the Christian life is not a cruise. The Christian life is a battleship. We are on this ship for one reason and one reason only. When, when sailors, soldiers are on a battleship, they are there, they're under the orders of their leader, and they're, they're working hard to, to advance their way of life and their leader's objective. And that's what we're doing. And they're coming against enemies that are trying to stop them from this. And that's exactly what we're doing. The enemy is not the people. It's the, it's the enemy of your souls. It's the devil. Okay, he's constantly coming against that. And we need to be people that are taking orders from our leader, trying to advance his way of life to the world that we have influence over. Now, obviously, we're not doing it forcibly, forcefully, like, the, like someone on a battleship would. We're not forcing people, don't, don't put your foot on someone's throat and force them to get saved. That's not how it works for us, right? But we are, we're working hard to advance the kingdom of God because there is an enemy fighting against the kingdom. In fact, what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twelve. He said, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. That's saying the enemy, the enemy of our souls is not sitting back, twiddling his thumbs, hoping that nobody gets saved. He's not doing it. He is forcefully, aggressively working against the kingdom of God. He is, take, he is the violent that's working against it. And then Jesus says the violent take it by force. He's saying that we need to be violent to take the, take the kingdom of God, to go to advance the kingdom of God. Now, we're not violent against people. Our battle's not against people. It's against flesh and blood. Paul said our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, principalities, the rulers of this dark world. That's what our battle is against. And church, as long as there are people dying and going to hell, they're worth it. It's worth it for us to fight for those people. And to be violent. The enemy's violent against us. We need to be violent against him. And be proactive in living out in such a way that our life tells of the goodness of God. That, that furthers the kingdom of God. That furthers the gospel. I read a statistic the other day. I'm reading a book right now. And I read a statistic about it's about our culture. And it says that since 1991, so in 27 years, the population of the United States has grown 15%. Which is pretty normal. But the, the percentage of unchurched, people that would say that they are unchurched, don't, aren't affiliated with a church or religion, the percentage during that same 27-year stretch has grown 91%. 91%. That means that in 27 years, the amount of unchurched people in the United States has almost doubled. We are in a war, and the church is losing the war because too many of us are seeing our, our walk as a cruise ship. And there's people out in the water, we're on our cruise ship, there's people drowning in the water, and we're too busy sipping on our lemonade and our tea to notice it. And we can't do it. We can't do it. We are the ones that God uses to share his love, to spread that gospel. If, no, if none of the believers, if all of us Christians just shut our mouth and live our lives privately and don't do anything for one generation, Christianity's gone. Like, God uses us to advance his kingdom. Okay? Now, the good news is we know his kingdom, the, 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 God, the Christian faith will never go away. Okay? The Christians will never be completely silent and not share. But what I'm saying is we need to have a revival in us, that this becomes a priority, that we would do whatever it takes to never leave any stone unturned when it comes to try to winning the people in our life for Jesus. Okay? And when we hear that statistic, I think we respond one of two ways in our heart. I think one way we respond is we kind of get frustrated about it and we want to fight against those people you say you know what society's too far gone i'm just going to trust the lord he's going to do what he's going to do but what i'm going to do is i'm going to kind of create this we versus them mentality we talk about the the world the secular society as if they're this you know disgusting gross thing that we just need to stay away from we kind of circle the wagons and become our own little thing and we just hope for the best god you know go get them you know i hope you do your thing with them and god's saying no get out from outside your little circle and go do something right and we argue with them, we might fight with them on social media and, and, and want to get really frustrated about things, but we're not necessarily willing to really love them in a way that they need to be loved. So that's the one response. I think the other one would be that that statistic would break our heart and say, this is not good. This cannot be. I will not stand for this. I'm not going to just keep living my life and hoping for the best and hoping that God does what, what I'm asking him to do. Now, prayer and asking God to move is a huge part of it because nobody can come to the Lord unless the Holy Spirit draws him. But he uses us. I mentioned this last week. The Holy Spirit is in us. So he is using us to go out and share that love with our world. 
so that they will see Jesus for who he really is. He's not some religious uh, right-wing nut like so many people think he is. He's the savior of the world. He's the one that, that put down the crown in heaven and came down to earth as a little baby born in a little feeding trough in Bethlehem and lived a life getting ridiculed and mocked and eventually killed on a cross just so he, because of how much he loves us so that we can have that relationship with him. That's the kind of Jesus we, we serve and that we should be telling others about, right? It's huge. It's so important for us. And we have to be willing to do whatever it takes. You know, I made the analogy in the first service, like if, if you were to, uh, for the, the wives and the husbands, if you were to lose your wedding ring, your diamond ring, you know, maybe your husband went, went out on a limb and really spent more than he should have on your wedding ring and it's really nice. And, and if you're in the backyard playing with the kids and all of a sudden you realize your ring's gone, it's in the grass somewhere. You would stop everything, get on your hands and knees, you'd lose all dignity. You wouldn't worry about pretense, you wouldn't worry, worry about appearances, you'd be on your hands and knees going through that grass like this. Up and down, you know, and you got dog doo-doo in the yard, just pushing it out of the way till you get to that ring, you know, like we would do whatever it took to get that ring. We'd be yelling at the kids, kids, stop everything you're doing. Get in here. Let's find this ring. You go to the Academy sports, buy a metal detector. You're walking around with headphones on. You're doing whatever you got to do to find that ring. I know I would be. That's how we need to live our life pursuing the lost because they're lost in the weeds. And we should be living to pursue them in a way that, will, that we would not stop until we win them. Not trying to convince them, not arguing with them about, no, you need Jesus. But just loving them in a way that they can't resist it. That they're saying, man, whatever you got, I want it. You know? That's what going and telling it is all about, church. And, and I know, you know, today... I'm hoping to pump you up. We're going, to be, I'm going to be, uh, we're going to be sharing one of the outreaches we do in this church. And I, and I believe it's going to tug on your heartstrings too, and it's exciting. But it can't stop at the end of 2018. It needs to be a lifestyle we live forever. I want to be known as someone that lived my life for others, not for myself. Amen? And that needs to be something we are intentional about. So our life tells it in how we love others. And I know you lose a lot of men when you start talking about how we love others because that feels a little too ooey-gooey. So let me just translate it. We, our life tells it in how we fight for others. We're not fighting against them, we're fighting for them. That's what we're doing for the loss. And our life tells it in how we do that. And, and for the rest of today and then next week, we're gonna talk about aspects of our life that can actually tell of the love of God in others or, or for others through our life. But today I'm just gonna talk about one thing and that's generosity. Generosity in our life tells of the love of God to others more than anything else probably. And now when I talk about generosity, I'm, I'm not just talking about our money, which money is obviously a part of that. You can't be generous without being generous financially too. But what I'm talking about is going above and beyond in our life for others. The, the definition of generosity is to do more than what is expected. Doing more than what is expected. We fight by being generous. We show that our faith is not dead, like James said. We show it's not dead by being generous because it will it will translate in people's lives. It will make an impact in people's lives. Look what Proverbs 11:25 says. It says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. A generous person prospers. Now, you can take this. If you want to, you can take this and say, ooh, a generous person prospers. That means I'm gonna be rich if I'm generous. So we can give and be generous with the wrong motivation. That's not what this verse is saying. Now, does God bless some people that are generous to be rich? Yes, God blesses people to be wealthy. And I'm very thankful for those people because they're the ones that can, that can give extravagantly. But what I believe this verse means more than that is that, uh, that we will prosper on the inside, that we will all be rich on the inside. A generous person is always rich on the inside. They're always refreshed. They're always, they always feel good. They've always got a positive outlook on life because they know that everything we have is God's and we're called to share it with others. And you may say, well, what, what's, what's the big deal about being generous? In, in our society, people being generous makes an impact in people's lives. When we go above and beyond, when we do more than what is expected, it makes an impact in people's lives because our society expects you to do what's expected. So if you're just, what they expect out of Christians is that, yeah, that we're gonna be nice, you know, and then we're gonna go to church and, you know, they'll see us praying before our meal at restaurants. And that's the things they expect from Christians. But when we go above and beyond and we say, I'm gonna show you more because of the love of my God, then it makes an impact in people's lives. It forces them to take notice of what we're doing because, uh, because we're not just doing what's expected, but we're going above and beyond. We're sacrificing. You know, what the apostle Paul tells us that we're to consider others' needs ahead of our own. Literally says to put other people's needs before your own. It, be, the reason Paul's saying that is not because he wants us to be, you know, always worried about everybody else and never taking care of ourselves. He's not saying to take care of yourself. But what he's saying is if we will put other people's needs first, if we'll go above and beyond what's expected, 
it will cause the gospel to spread. It will cause the gospel to spread every time. Now, it may not happen the first time you do it. You know, you, you see somebody that is in need and you help them out. It may not cause them to get on their knees and worship Jesus right there on the spot. It, sometimes you have to pour into people for a long time and continue to be generous. That's why we make a lifestyle of being generous. It's not just a single act. It's actually a lifestyle that we live. Look at, uh, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, everybody say, in the same way. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, going above and beyond doing what's expected looks different for depending on your situation. It may look like doing, uh, doing more at work than what's expected of you. Now, going above and beyond in your job. It may mean doing more in your marriage. You know, if you, if you do what's expected in marriage, you'll have a respectable marriage. If you go above and beyond and you're generous with your spouse in marriage, you're going to have an exceptional marriage. You're going to have a, uh, it's, it's going to be more exciting. You know, men, I know we, December comes, we're always worried about money because there's a lot more money being spent in December than other months. And it's easy to kind of get tight and, and uh, be careful. But you know what? Sometimes we just need to go out on a limb and bless our wives and be generous with them. And, and you see the fruit from that. And it's the same way with the gospel. When we let our light shine, you know, this light shining, you can look at that verse and think, well, what does it mean to have my light shine? It means to let, Jesus explains it there. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. He's talking about the life we live, the deeds that we perform on a daily basis. That's our light. He says, don't put it under a bowl. You don't put a light under a bowl. You put it up on a stand so that people will see it. And then he says, and then when they see it, they will praise your father in heaven. So what, there's the, that, that, word, that word there is a key word where it says your father. He's talking about you doing this to the world, the people that don't see our God as their heavenly father. And when they see the deeds we do, when we're generous with our life and, and they, they see that coming from us, it will cause them to praise my father. That's pretty cool. Now, Eventually, the plan is that my father will also become their father and they'll praise him, we'll praise him together. But what he's saying here is if your deeds are seen and you're out there, you're being generous and you're doing more than is expected, they will praise your father. They'll say, wow, this guy's, this guy's God is pretty awesome. Look what he's doing for us. And it makes an impact in their lives. That's what generosity does. And when they see that, they'll praise our father in heaven and eventually it'll be their father too. If we're not shining with the light of Jesus with our deeds, we're not functioning in the way God intends us to function. It really is that simple. And it's a challenge from Jesus for us. That was, those were the words of Jesus. He's challenging us, saying, yes, yes, let your deeds be seen by men. Do it. We, don't, we don't let our deeds be seen by men so that we get praised for it. We do it in a way so that our God gets praised for it. Amen? So let me quickly give you three ways that generosity will tell it in our life. Okay, I'm gonna go through these quickly. The first one is serving others. Serving others generously will tell of the goodness of God in your life. Look at what Paul says in Galatians 5, 13 and 14. He says, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Hallelujah for that. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. We all, know, we all know that verse, love your neighbor as yourself. It's very difficult to do because there is so many things pulling at our time to serve others. Serving others is really easy. If the opportunity arises and we're there and somebody says, hey, can you help me with this? Uh, of course, we're, we're gonna be willing to do that. But to really be intentional and go above and beyond in serving others and loving your neighbor as yourself, that's hard to do because our time every day just gets devoured, doesn't it? Like there's a thousand things pulling at our time every single day. And so it's hard to remember to serve others. But when we serve others generously, when we go above and beyond, it makes people take notice. And I don't know exactly what that looks like in your life. Again, like it might mean in your job, you know, maybe you're just doing your job, you're just doing the minimum. And if you do what is expected in your job, you'll probably keep your job. But if you go above and beyond and you're generous and you serve your boss, whether he deserves it or not, and you serve your coworkers and you show up early and leave late sometimes, that is something that will make an impact in their life. And it will spread the gospel. When we serve others generously, it spreads the gospel. 
The second one is forgiveness. Now, this, you wouldn't necessarily equate forgiveness with generosity, but the kind of forgiveness I'm talking about does because I'm not talking about if somebody wrongs you and they come and apologize and ask your forgiveness humbly and you receive it and, and, or you extend forgiveness and everything's good. I'm talking about extravagantly extending forgiveness to those that don't deserve it, okay? Those that don't come to you and say, I'm sorry, even though they've wronged you and they know it. When you go above and beyond and forgiving and being generous with people in forgiveness, it spreads the gospel, church. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because forgiveness is the core of the gospel. The whole, the reason you and me are saved is because we got forgiven for something we don't deserve. We can say we're sorry all day long to God. He could say, I'm sorry, he doesn't cut it. You're not good enough. He could do that, but he didn't. He sent his son to pay the price so we don't have to do that. So he, he extended forgiveness to us. Uh, extravagantly, the most extravagant way that could ever possibly be fathomed is what Jesus did for us. So he in turn says, now you got to do the same thing. And if you do it, it'll spread the gospel. You know, in, in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he talks about a lot of things. He talks about adultery. He talks about murder. He talks about divorce. He talks about what happens when somebody beats you up, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But we also have the Lord's Prayer in, in that sermon. Where, where he says, forgive us, we're, we're to pray this, Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sinned against me. So he gives the harshest words of all, all those things are about forgiveness. Look, look what he says in, uh, in, right at the end of the Lord's Prayer in, in verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 6. He says, for, you, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's pretty harsh, but it's, Jesus is saying that is because that's the core of what he's doing. That's everything that we have, everything that is good in us is based on his forgiving us, even though we didn't deserve it. So he says, I want you to go do likewise. Uh, a number of years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, um, I was dealing with some stuff with, with my dad. Um, he, we have a history. He, he, he made a lot of mistakes in, in marriage and in fatherhood, and, and I had some hurts, uh, some things he'd done to me specifically, that, that it hurt me, that, that he knew it, but he just was never able to quite get himself to that place where he would really humble himself and apologize, you know. He's part of that generation that just kind of sweeps everything under the rug and you act like it didn't happen. And, and I was dealing with it specifically one day pretty hard. And I was driving down the road um, in my Ford truck, by the way. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to call him and forgive him. And I remember thinking, yeah, right. Like, sure, let me grab my phone and call him. That'll be great. You know, we're talking about decades worth of stuff here. And uh, of course, I argued with him for a little while, the Lord. And how many of you know you never went and argued with the Lord? And so uh, I finally called him. And as I started talking, I started feeling my heart just melt. I, said, I just called him. I said, Dad, I just want you to know I forgive you for everything that's ever happened. And I said, you have a clean slate with me, and I will never, ever bring it up ever again. Never. And my dad's, you know, pretty tough, unemotional you know, kind of that rugged contractor guy. And I didn't hear anything on the other end of the phone when I was done talking. And I thought, oh, great. He's going to sit there and go, okay, thanks. And about 15, 20 seconds later, I hear sobbing on the, on the other end of the phone. And my dad, when he finally got the, was able to speak, he said, you will never know what that means to me. And it melted his heart completely. And and it, it mended our relationship. Uh, I, I remember, I mean, I remember where I was. I was in front of Daniel Field driving up Wrightsboro Road. Like that's how big of an impact it's made in my life, how much I remember that and what it did even in his life and in our life together. When we extend extravagant forgiveness, it furthers the gospel. People don't have to deserve your forgiveness for you to forgive them because you don't deserve it either. Right. And when we do it, we re, we're, not, we're not saying what you did is okay. We're releasing them because that's what God calls us to do. And it furthers the gospel of Jesus Christ in our life. Okay. Uh, lastly is our resources. If we are generous with our resources, it tells people that we love God. If we trust our God enough to say, God, my, my money is yours. Everything I have is yours. And we, and we show that it spreads the gospel. The gospel grows when we are generous with our resources. Now, let me just say, I, talking about money is always a hairy issue. You know, it, it, it's just, there's, it's always a little bit unnerving. If you're part of New Hope, you know, we don't talk about money very often. We, we trust the Lord with this. We don't like to try to manipulate or pound people to, to give more. And this church is always very generous. Uh, in fact, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago with a, a, an organization that's going to be doing some stuff for the church. And they want to know some of the history of the church and kind of who we are. And they were asking us. And the very first thing that came out of, that went into my head was our diversity and how, how wonderfully diverse our church is. 
ethnically, racially, culturally, everything, age, and was really excited about that. But the second thing right after that that came out of my mouth was the generosity of the church. This church is phenomenally generous in giving to the cause of Christ. And the fact that you trust this, the church here so much to, to use the finances that you give us to, to help further the kingdom of God is really humbling. But, I, but on an individual level, we still, we have to continue to make that part of our lifestyle, that we are always holding everything that God gives us with an open hand. And, and, and what I'll say to that is, you know, you may be hearing what I'm saying and thinking, you know, this is, this is good. I, I, I believe this. I believe that's the heart of God, you know, that we would go and tell it, that we would live a lifestyle of generosity. But I just, if I'm honest, I know by the time I get out in the parking lot, I'm going to be thinking about lunch and I'm probably going to forget about it. And it's not really going to change anything in my life. And, and you might say, like, I don't want it to be that way. I just know it's going to be that way. I would tell you what, what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 21. This is another part of his Sermon on the Mount. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart will follow your money. It's not the other way around. Your money doesn't follow your heart. Your heart follows your money. So if you want to have more of a heart for the lost, that's where you sow seed. Sow seed to help winning the lost, and your heart will be there for the lost. It's really just that simple. You sow seed into buying a $50,000 pickup truck, your heart's going to be in that truck. Somebody scratches it in the parking lot, it's going to upset you because you got investment in that vehicle, right? So if we invest in the lost, we're going to have our heart's going to be there, and we're going to be concerned about people getting saved. And whether that's through the church or whether that's through other ministries or charities, whatever it is, investing in the lost is what helps us to get our heart focused on the lost. Look what Jesus says. He goes on to say in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Your devotion can only be to one thing. It's really that simple. When we're generous, with our, with our resource that God gives us, it helps spread the gospel. And uh, we don't make any apologies here at New Hope for, for even asking for money because we know that it takes money to make the gospel go out too. But the church isn't the only place that you can sow that seed either, okay? But on the, on the heels of that, I'm actually gonna invite Jessica up here from, you know, Kel and Jess, that thing. Um, she's gonna come up and she's gonna share about a ministry that our church is involved in. Most of you probably don't even know we're involved in it. We've been doing it for quite a while. Um, but we're going to share a little more about it today because we wanted you to know that our church is actually being generous too in, in trying to be faithful in that. So make Jessica welcome. Hello, okay, so uh, there's a ministry that the church has been involved in for quite some time, as I was saying, and I'm just going to let Jessica introduce you to it and uh, kind of tell us what it is and how long you've been involved and how it started. Yeah, okay. So what we're talking about today, we have named Hope in the Dark. And essentially what we do, um, we go to strip clubs downtown, Augusta. And I just want to say from the onset, um, I'm sitting in the room with a bunch of women who have made this possible, who have gone and helped and, and done that. So I want you to, to know that. Really thankful. But... Um, so it, next year, we're actually, we'll be down there nine years. It'll be our nine-year anniversary that we've been doing this. We don't really talk about it a whole lot, mostly because of the nature of the ministry and um, the privacy issues and just, you know, the nature of it. Also, the team is very small. Um, it kind of has to be because of the facilities that we go in. They're very small, and so only, you know, can let two or three people in at a time. So we have a very small team who does that. Um, but in how it started, we... We're downtown doing something totally different, and there was a bartender who was standing outside. We walked up to them. We asked them, like, if there were any needs that they might have at that, this club, and they shared that they needed some really practical needs. They needed some feminine products for the women, and that that would be super helpful if we could do that, and we had that available through the bridge ministry. And so we were able to go and give it to them. They were very thankful and I think very shocked that we came back. And um, we just were like, we want to have relationship with you guys. And they were freaked out by that, as you could imagine. And um, we just were like, what can we do? So what happened is we developed a relationship where we would go at um, holidays at first. So the very first thing we really did was at Valentine's Day, um, they were the one club that we were in at the time. They needed a mirror for the dressing room because they didn't have one. And so um, we got a mirror. We went and installed it. 
um, that was probably one of the first times we got to interact with the girls down there. And, um, you know, from there, we just kind of went at holidays. And then from holidays, it grew to like once a month. And we just built relationship with them. And for probably a year, two years, we just were focused on building relationship with the girls. And at the time, the church, we were gearing up to do um, an Easter event with the children here and getting ready for our Easter service. And so we were brave enough to just kind of share. This was kind of the first time we'd ever really made a plug for our church because, you know, our goal in going down there has never been to force anybody to quit their job. Our goal has always been to encourage people in their relationship with the Lord and to build relationship with them and to get to know them and to tell them how valuable they are and how loved they are. So that's always been our goal. But we just kind of shared with them, hey, this is what we're doing. You can invite your kids. And so we had two of our girls show up at that event with their kids. And subsequently, the next day, they came to church here, came down to our altar, gave their heart to the Lord. It was a phenomenal. Um, and she, she ended up leaving the club. She, she was like, well, you know, there's other clubs downtown. We were like, we know. You know, we were only in the one at the time. She was like, you guys need to be doing this for everybody. Like, they should all be able to, to experience this. And so one of our girls actually got us into the other two clubs that we're in currently. Um, and so we just have for nine years been building relationship. And logistically, because I'm sure you're probably wondering, I have a lot of questions. And I, if somebody were to tell me something like this, I'd want to know, what does that look like, right? This is, this is what I'll tell you. It's awkward. <laughs> As you can imagine, I feel like the more I come to love the Lord, the more I realize loving God means we're always going to be in awkward situations and it's embracing it. <laughs> Sharing the gospel is awkward sometimes. Um, I love awkward situations. So I kind of like it, but um, it's just kind of awkward sometimes. And so we just have been building relationships for nine years. We're now in two clubs down there. Um, we're not in the one we originally started with. It actually closed. So we're in the two clubs. But logistically, what we do is we go once a month. Um, we take a gift because um, we just want to show them how loved they are. We um, take them roses. And we um, we talk about their lives. We catch up with them. We have become friends with them. And we pray with them. And we share the gospel when we can. So it's kind of logistically what we do. Well, that's really great. Um, I, I think for some of the people even here in this room that you know aren't familiar with that scene, um, maybe asking like why why do we go minister to these girls? Like I mean, you know what's what's the motivating factor for that? Because they're they're there, they're they're getting paid for it. It's a job, you know. Um, it's voluntary. You know what we see uh, sometimes in society is that it's somewhat glamorized. So. What, what's the motivating factor for actually going and ministering to these girls? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, I grew up in, I've, I've grown up in church. I've been going to church since I was five years old. I do think sometimes the church, and I don't think we've intentionally done this, but I think if we're not careful, what we can do is that you mentioned this in your message, just, you know, it becomes us versus them. And we can stereotype, we can make judgments on things that we don't know about until we enter into it. And I think one of the greatest things that I've learned being involved in the club ministry is that we're all dealing with a form of broken. Their brokenness looks different than mine, but we're all dealing with brokenness. And I need someone to, to encourage me and share the gospel with me. And so, um, and I think too, like, you know, going in there, I remember one of the very first times that we went in there and we, we actually had interactions with the girls and we were asking to pray with them. You know, it's like... It just you, there's just this this feeling of being awkward, but the, as you get to know them and you build a relationship with them, and we sit down with them, and you realize very quickly they're just really normal. They're wives and their sisters and their daughters and their moms, and they're trying to figure out bills and they're worried and they have a lot of anxiety and they're they're trying to figure out life too. And you you quickly realize like we're really no different. Like I'm no different than them. My struggle is different, but it's it's all struggle. And um, I think there's just a lot of misconceptions about that kind of environment that, you know, they, they're so empowered and they want to be there and they make so much money. And, you know, I think that's probably few and far between. And um, if you were to poll most of the girls, like, 
that's not really the case, and most of them don't want to be doing that. And I think you, we take for granted how much of, you know, when you grow up in a home and your parents tell you, like, hey, you need to go to school, and they take you to school and they provide you opportunities to do that, it's really easy for you to go to school. But we have a lot of girls who, you know, their parents don't really care what, what, whether or not they're doing that. And so think about for a girl who has now dropped out of school, she doesn't really have any, she doesn't have a degree, so she can't really, getting a job is difficult. And so she, you know, finds herself in this position. She's now dancing. If she were to leave, if she were to go fill out a, a resume for another job, well, now she has to put that down as her history of employment, which makes it super difficult now to get a job. And so I think that there are some times where there are patterns of just being stuck. And it's really no fault of their own because life has, it has been difficult. And there's been a lot of brokenness that they've walked through. And so I guess like what I, what I would tell people is like, it's just like any of us, you know, it's so different when you enter into somebody's story, you know, and you get to know who they are and, and what they've gone through. And so I just have, I've really come to learn like, you know, they're just no different than me. You know, we're all just kind of doing life and trying to figure out stuff. And yeah. yeah and I think that, uh, you know, all kinds of barriers are broken down when we get into people's story and get into their life. You know, uh, racial barriers are broke down when we, when we uh, cross over those lines and we get to know people of different race and realize, oh, huh, you're just a normal person like me. You know, we're, we're all the same. We're all in this together. And um, we, we care about the stories and, and we've grown to really love these girls and we care about their stories. And, um, and on that note, maybe you could tell one or two of the, the stories that have really impacted you over the last years. Yeah, um, well... I could tell you a million of them. I do think it's really funny to tell you this. Like, when we go down there, they call us the church ladies, which is just really funny. Because <laughs> I tell them all the time, like, if you only knew what I thought of when you said church ladies, but okay. Um, but the one of the stories that I can think of... Um, which was just has just been a phenomenal and we're still working it out we're all still in progress I mean you know I don't think we're ever like okay and like we move on you know um but one of the girls she um when we first started going so we had probably been going three or four years until she started coming and she on the onset was very difficult <laughs> she was not having us coming in there just like and I think you know that's part of the thing is building trust and relationship I think a lot of them if you if you know their background like consistency is just not something that's a part of their everyday life and so um, it takes them a while to get to know us and trust us and so at first she was very difficult like I'm saying would say all the things you could think of that would be shock and awe and she would you know do outrage just things and we just you know loved her and just laughed and said you know that that's not who you are you know we just just continued to love on her and um if you knew a little bit about her her background she her parents actually got her the job there because they thought it would be fun um she had terminated um three pregnancies before, um, was very broken and, um, was an atheist. You know, she just really, because of the life, I guess that she had lived, just really felt like God was far from her. And so didn't really have a belief in the Lord. And so very hard ground. And we just showed up every single month and, and just entered into the awkward conversations and loved on her and continued to be consistent in her life. And just slowly but surely, you know, those walls just came down and she began to love us and text us like, when are you coming? You know, now it's like she hated when we walked in the door and now she's like, when, when are you coming back? You know, and um, she actually ended up leaving the club and got a job outside of it she, because she got pregnant. She ended up keeping that baby and um, carried full term, and she still has that baby. She's a mom. And um, interestingly enough, about three years ago, uh, you know, like I said, we, we always talk about the gospel. And we talk about church. We try not to – Our definitely our goal is not to be like – you know, come to our church because, you know, this is the only way. We just encourage them in their walk with the Lord. But I got really brave about three or four years ago, and I was like, so – I come and see you at your job. What if you came and saw me at my job? Because <laughs> I knew we were going to be doing some the Christmas sweaters thing. It would have been funny. Like I was just trying to tell her, and she was like, "Well, what what are you going to do?" And I'm like, "Well, then explaining Christmas sweaters to her was <laughs> very awkward conversation." And she was like, "I mean, I guess." She was like, "But I want donuts and chocolate milk when I walk in." And I was like, "Done. 
So we met her in the parking lot with donuts and chocolate milk. <laughs> we walked her right up to over here, and that's where she sat, and she sat through service. And that was one of the first services that she's been in a very long time because she didn't, you know, she doesn't believe in the Lord. She's an atheist. And she did not stand her in worship and fold her hands the entire time, but it was totally fine. And afterwards, you're like, what do you think? And she's like, I mean, it's fine. And you're like, okay, you know, like, but just so amazing. And, like, she is Come, she's come back every single year since then. We call it her Christmas tradition. Last year when she came, she told us we did not have to meet her with, with donuts and chocolate milk. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we're gaining there. But um, even that, like, I love, that's one of the best things I love about New Hope is that they're in your midst. I mean, we've had a lot of girls actually come in here and sit in those seats that you're sitting in next to you. And you have never made them feel like any less love than they are. And it's just like a really beautiful thing. So her story just... Um, it's sort of remarkable in the sense of just being able over years to see that kind of response to us. And I think like her story really speaks of consistency. I think so many times we, we, we don't, we undervalue what consistency does in people's lives, wherever we're at, you know, like they just want to know that we're going to come back and we're just going to be faithful and we're going to continue to tell them like, Hey, this is who you are. We're going to continue to lead them into purpose. Um, but if I could share another story with you that is far from that one. Um, we, I got a call on um, Chris, uh, Thanksgiving uh, night, so well, technically Friday morning at about 12.30, and um, one of our girls called me, and she was in a panic, and she's like, you have to come down to the hospital. One of our girls has overdosed. You need to come down here, she's screaming, crying. And so um, I got up. We were down there at the hospital at you know, 12.45, and we were there until probably about 10.30, and um, she had been without oxygen for a very long time. She had overdosed in, at the club, and um, she was put on life support, and if you knew this girl, I mean, beautiful, comes from a very broken past. Um, her mom actually introduced her to drugs, and just, you know, there's just a lot of brokenness. Super sweet, incredibly beautiful. Every time we would come in, there was that level of awkward. She just did not want to have anything to do with what we were doing. And I, you know, we all, it's always that tension of like, when do you push? Because you want them to know. And when, when is it okay, you know, to kind of let them, let them go at their pace. And um, so uh, we just found out. On Friday evening, she actually passed away. They had to remove her from life support. She had no brain activity. Um, but it was really beautiful because I ran into one of our girls at the hospital. I happened to be there for something else. And she was like, you know, you really need to go see her. And so um, I was able to go into the, the ICU room. And we, we, I held hands with her and her mom as she took some of her last breaths. And we prayed. And um, I was able to encourage her mom about how beautiful her daughter was and how much she was loved. And... That's definitely not the way that we had hoped that that would go because obviously we would have wanted something very different for her. And um, I just think even like thinking about going and telling it, you know, the thing we were, Joy and I were talking and I was like, I just was thinking through every situation where it was so awkward where she was in the corner and I was like, you know, I should push, but I don't know if I should or shouldn't. And, um, you know, just thinking like sometimes going and telling it feels super awkward. And if we're honest, it makes us feel really uncomfortable. But how important it is because at the end of the day, life and death is in the balance. It really is. And um, just really thankful that obviously it didn't go the way that we had wanted it to. But that for a moment, for a season that we had with her, that we did consistently tell her, you know, how beautiful she was. And we were there and you know, three months ago, we had sat down with her. She was in the corner again, and I just sat with her, and I said, you're, you're being really quiet. And she's like, well, she was like, you know, I'm really trying to get sober. I've been sober for three months, and she was really trying, you know, but there's just, there's such a level of brokenness, and I think the holidays had, had really brought that on because of, you know, the life that she had come from. So, but even in, you know, for us, like, the fact that the girls called us to come down to the hospital, we are their support system. I mean, that is that is what we have become. We've become family, you know, because a lot of them don't come from, like, a lot of support. They don't have anybody who's 
encouraging them and saying like, hey, you're wonderful, you know, like God loves you. And it's just a testament to that consistency, you know, that when they do need someone, they have people they can call, you know, and so, yeah. Yeah, not every story ends up being like a Hollywood script, but uh, there are lots and lots of really good stories that we could, I know she could tell for hours and some of the other girls that have helped too. Um, Just quickly, I I know we're running a little late. Give us five more minutes and we'll be done. But uh, um, it is Christmas season and, you know, we've been trying to do uh, things to bless these girls over the last few years for Christmas. So if you could just share quickly kind of what we've been doing and what we're hoping to do this year. Yeah, so... A couple of years ago, you know, 95% of our girls are moms. And as you can imagine, because we all feel that tension when it comes to Christmas time, we want to make Christmas special for our kids, don't we? And there's always that tension and a level of anxiety for them. And so a couple of years ago, we kind of all talked and we were like, what can we do? You know, we've been, we've, you know, we've had so much relationship for so many years. What if we did something just super crazy and we gave them gift cards, you know, that they would be able to help provide for Christmas because, you know, their kids, they're, they're normal kids sitting in a classroom, you know, probably with your children and they, they want Christmas too. Like they, they want to have an awesome time. And so we were like, what can we do? And so we, we thought like a gift card would work because we could do, they could do food and they could do gifts and it kind of covers them for Christmas. And we were able to take the first year, we were able to do a hundred dollar gift cards for all of them. And so that was really exciting. And we went in and you would have thought that we had literally given them the world. They were so excited, screaming, crying, all the things it was very beautiful. And, um, that was, you know, from your generosity and giving just from our church and, so then last year, um, because our home missions was it was what it was, we didn't have quite as much as we did the year before, but we were we ended up giving them fifty dollar gift cards last year. They still they loved it. Like for them, it's not about amount, it's about the fact that like for a moment, like that tension is eased for them. And so they were super excited and I did have one of my girls who is, you know, we, we have a very good relationship with her and she was crying and just sharing with us. It was even before we gave out the gift cards, just how hard the season had been. And she wasn't going to be able to do Christmas for her kids and the power bills and food and all kinds of stuff. And so when we had gone in, we actually had four gift cards left over. And so we decided like, we should go give them to her. Like we have great relationship with her. So we snuck back in and I pulled her to the side and we were like, here's this. Don't tell anybody that you got extra, but, you know, we want to make sure that your kids are taken care of. And she actually sent me some photos. I think we have them from last year. So there's that. She's able to get a bike for her girl. And then there are some other gifts. She sent me a text on Christmas morning. These were the photos that I got. And she said, I want you to know, like, I was able, I spent it all on my kids. They were so excited. We love you guys so much. Thank you for everything that you do. And, um, you know, that's like, it's because of your generosity, because of this church's generosity that we're able to do things like that. And it means the world to them. And I know, you know, we can sit up here and talk about this. This is one ministry of many that we have. And I know that maybe you're like, oh, like if only, but you know, the reality is when we go to the clubs, you go with us. You know, we go physically, but you all go. And that's the beauty of when you give. Because when you give, it's going to, we're all reaping the blessing from it, you know. And they know your names. They know New Hope. And when they come to church, they come to New Hope. And they, they love it. They love you guys. And we're just really thankful. So we sat around again this year and we thought... Well, we're talking about going and telling it. We're talking about like one of the ways that we can go and tell it is through our generosity. And we thought we would, we would open it up and have you guys help us. And so we have around 30 girls in between both clubs. And our goal today is we would love to raise about $6,000. And that would cover, that would, that would get us to $200 gift cards per girl. I think that it would absolutely blow them away. I think they would be just unbelievably excited. And I, I do think too, because of the loss of one of our girls, I think just this season has been really tough. And so we just have been like, you know, what could we do to kind of make that better? So that's kind of what we're asking. And you have envelopes in your chairs and... So, yeah, that's the goal. It's kind of what we're hoping for. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, and and that, is, that is uh why those envelopes are there. We're, we we kind of did some math. We figured if everybody gives $10 towards this ministry, we will be able to bless these girls in a way that I believe is going to take our relationship with them to the next level and show them the love of God with the generosity that we give. So we're not asking you to empty your wallet. I mean, unless you want to do that, that's, we're not going to stop you. But... Uh, if everybody just gives 10 bucks, we'll be able to really, really go all out 
and do some amazing things for these girls this Christmas. And, uh, and I, when we have testimonies, I promise you we're going to come back and share them. You know, we don't talk about this ministry a lot because it is sensitive, uh, but we do, if we are asking you to help, then we're going to also come back and give you the testimonies that come with it. So um, I'm going to pray over us. If you want to stand with me, please, as we close. Uh, actually, after I pray, Kel's going to come up and just mention one thing before you're actually dismissed, but I want to pray over us today. God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you are so good and that your mandate in our life, Lord, if we have received that mandate to go and tell it, it tells me that, that I have received your love. And so, God, we thank you for that today. We thank you for your love, for your mercy and your grace that encompasses everything that we do, Lord. And I pray, God, that our deeds would show our faith, that, that our, our light would shine before men so that they will praise your Father in heaven. I pray that that work would be sealed in our heart, that when we leave today that we won't forget it, but that it will stay with us and we will make a lifestyle, a, a habit and a lifestyle of going and telling it to those that you've put in our lives, Lord. We want to be faithful with what you've given us. Help us to give us eyes to see the war that we are in so that we can, we can be soldiers in your army. And God, that we would not fight against the people, but we are fighting against the enemy. And I pray that you'd help us in that today, God. I pray you bless everyone as they give today, Lord, that, that this would all go for your glory, for your kingdom. We pray that the, these girls would even be affected by this in a mighty way. And we ask it today in Jesus' name.